Quiet on the set. Camera speed. Sound production, take one. Action! Welcome to From Beneath the Hollywood Sign. If you love old movies, Hollywood history, or the golden age of filmmaking, you've come to the right place. This is the podcast that talks about amazing stories of Tinseltown from another era. Hear fascinating conversations with writer-producer Steve Kubine, who quite literally lives just beneath the Hollywood sign, and actress-writer Nan McNamara. Now your hosts, Steve and Nan. Welcome to our Halloween episode. So exciting. Or as some people call it, the start of the Christmas season. <laughs> so I have great memories, I'm sure you do too, of Halloween when I was a kid. Yes. Growing up in the Midwest, it was pretty awesome. One memory in particular, I was, as I was thinking of these films, was a party that my older sister had where she met, um, she invited her now husband, and he dressed up as Frankenstein. And it was the best costume. And he would come every year and we would walk with him and he would scare people. And it was amazing. I love that. I know. I, I just think Halloween is so different in the Midwest and the South where I yes. grew up. It's it's a whole thing. Yes. I, yes. I love Halloween. I just love dressing up. I still do. It excites me that we're going to be talking about some Halloween movies that maybe aren't as well known as some of the ones we're used to. Right. Which right. is what our theme is today. And we've kept our lists from each other. So I don't know the three that you're going to use, <laughs> yes. you're going to talk about, and you don't know the three that I'm going to talk about. So I, I can't wait to hear what you've I know. got up your sleeve. <laughs> Um, well, I think you want to go first. Yeah, let's just kick it off, and I'm, I'm going to kick it off a little light. Okay. I'm, I'm going to kick it off slowly. We're going to build up to the, the gore and the horror. Good. Um, uh, the first film I wanted to talk about was I Married a Witch from oh. 1942. It's not your typical spooky, gory, head exploding Hollywood Halloween film. But it's a fun one, and it's a great one to watch to get you in the mood for Halloween. It's this funny, sexy, romantic, screwball, spooky movie, if such a thing even exists. <laughs> <laughs> it's a new genre you just created. Exactly. But it stars the, the wonderful Veronica Lake and Frederick March, and it features a great supporting cast uh, made up of Robert Benchley and Cecil Kellaway, and one of my favorite character actresses ever, Elizabeth Patterson. Oh. Directed by the French native Renee Claire, who had just scored a hit for Marlena Dietrich in The Flame of New Orleans. And it's written by Robert Parach and Mark Connolly, but it's got an uncredited contribution by Dalton Trumbo. Oh! who we all know years later would be blacklisted. But it's fun. It's a supernatural screwball comedy where Veronica Lake plays Jennifer, a witch who, along with her father Daniel, the irresistible Cecil Kellaway, are burned at the stake during the Purian witch trials. But before they died, they put a curse on the male heirs of the family responsible for their fate. So this curse, and it's a fun one, it's to ensure that every male heir of the woolly family marries the wrong girl. <laughs> That's the curse. Hijinks ensue. Hijinks, spooky hijinks ensue. Well, this weird freak of nature happens, and Jennifer and her father Daniel are released back into the world. And so they set out to seek their revenge on the most current Wooly heir, a man named Jonathan Wooly, played by Frederick March. But at the time, he's a candidate for governor. He's engaged to a socialite named Estelle Masterson, who's played by the beautiful up-and-coming Susan Hayward. Oh. It was one of her first big, important movie roles. And she's wonderful. She plays a spoiled socialite, you can imagine. Yes. Well, things don't quite go as planned for Jennifer because she ends up falling in love with Jonathan. So then she oh. sets out to break up Estelle and Jonathan and get that man for her own self. <laughs> <laughs> um, which this does not fly at all with her father, who still wants to seek revenge. So you can imagine the romantic comedy, the spooky fun. It's just a fun, great movie. And I think everyone should see it for Halloween. It'll put you in the spirit. But behind the scenes wasn't so enchanting. Oh, okay. Isn't that <laughs> it, always the way? Uh, exactly. First of all, Preston Sturgis, the great Preston Sturgis, he was supposed to Direct produce it? this. He was oh, supposed produce to produce okay. this. But he'd already done hits like Christmas in July, The Lady Eve, Sullivan's Travels. Uh, but he and the director clashed. They, He and uh, Renee Claire did not get along, so Preston dropped out. Okay. Well, originally, Joel McRae was supposed to star as Jonathan Woolley, but he pulled out of the project the second he learned that he was to co-star with Veronica Lake. 
And why was that? He and Veronica Lake had worked together on Sullivan's Travels, oh. and it did not go well. Oh, okay. So it's he fact, knew, I don't want to live that again. Well, he he's quoted, he says, life is too short to ever work with Veronica Lake. Oh, goodness. <laughs> I know. Which That's was, strong. And she was complicated. She was difficult. I, I, I think she was dealing with some mental health issues. But ironically enough, he did work with her again in 1948 in a Western called Ramrod. So never say never, Joel McCray. No, right, right. <laughs> but, you know, it's a great movie. And so by Joel McCrae dropping out, that left the door open for Frederick March. Well, guess what? Frederick hated Veronica too. Oh, gosh. <laughs> they loathed each other while making this film, which is funny because they have such great screen chemistry. He called Veronica Lake a brainless little blonde sex pot void of any acting ability. And she referred to him as a pompous poser. Okay. So uh, no love lost on no. that. But you know what? Despite the acrimony behind the scenes, uh, the movie was a huge, huge hit. And it was actually the inspiration for the TV series Bewitched, starring Elizabeth Montgomery. I wondered about that. Yeah. And perfect because Elizabeth Montgomery is a beautiful blonde as well. Exactly. And very talented. And that's the first movie. So check it out if you want to get into the Halloween spirit. I love it. I'm going to check it out tonight. What you, my, what you got for okay, us? My choice is for... From 1955. It's inspired by Ron Perrier, who was my college professor in film and television. And he introduced me to the film Diabolique. Do you love yes, Diabolique? Yes, I love that film. Okay, well, oh. the, the title means The Devils or The Fiends. It's based on a novel, She Was No More, which Hitchcock actually tried to get the rights to, but was beaten to the punch by director Henri-Georges Lecluseau. Things worked out okay for Hitchcock because he did go on to direct Vertigo <laughs> in place of Diabolique. We, we won't feel too bad for him. No. The setting is a French boys boarding school with a wicked headmaster who everyone hates, all the teachers, all the kids. His wife also hates him, who owns the school, and his former mistress, who's a <laughs> teacher there. They all hate him. The story begins when the mistress, who is played by the great Simone Signore, and the wife, played by Vera Clouseau, the director's wife, <laughs> the two of them get together to plan to get rid of him. They are going to kill her husband and her former yes. lover. So if you don't know Simone Signore, she's a fabulous actress nominated for two Academy Awards, actually won in 1958 for Room at the Top. She is masterful in this role as the former mistress. Vera Clouseau, who plays the wife, was not as strong of an actress as Simone. And the director, her husband, was aware of that and purposely chose Simone as a, a way to kind of hold up Vera, his wife Vera. Oh, interesting. In Signor Ray's memoir, she tells the story of a couple of different things that happened. Number one, she signed an eight-week contract to film the movie. But the shooting actually took 16 weeks. She didn't read the fine print, or her agent didn't. Oh, no. And she ended up only being paid oh, for eight no. weeks. So despite that, there's also a story of the director, Clouseau, finding clever ways of lighting his wife's face <laughs> and muting the light on Signore so that his wife was not upstaged. So he has to go home and sleep with her. <laughs> yes, yes. I mean, needless to say, by the end of the filming, Simone Signore was not speaking to the director, was not speaking to Vera. Wow. One of the interesting things that I learned about the film is that the character of the police commissioner is the inspiration for Columbo. Oh, I didn't know yes, that. Yes, a couple of different sources had that as the first. And if you look at it, he wears a trench coat, he has a cigar, oh. he's always asking kind of the same question. This film has a wonderful twist at the end, which I am not going to give away. <laughs> One of the fun things about it is that in its original release, the director gets on film and says, see it, be amazed by it, but be quiet about it. <laughs> so it was one of the first films where they said, please don't give the ending away. Like The Crying Game. <laughs> yes, exactly, like The Crying Game. There have been multiple American remakes of it. I have not seen any of them, but apparently the one with Sharon Stone and Isabella Johnny from 1996 is pretty good. But I say, see the original. Yes. One other quick story about it. A man wrote to Alfred Hitchcock and said, Sir, after seeing Diabolique, my daughter was afraid to take a bath. Now she has seen your psycho and is afraid to take a shower. <laughs> what should I do with her? And Hitchcock replied, 
send her to the dry cleaners. Uh, <laughs> that's fantastic. So that's Diabolique. Check it out. It's actually on, I think I found it again on HBO Max or one of the streaming services has it right now. Yeah, it's such a great movie. So haunting. Yes. That's a great one. That's a great one to really get you in the mood. Good. Yeah, that was really good. Okay. Good choice, too. Great, great. All Steve, right. I'm so excited to hear your second ha- oh, Halloween movie. Good. Well, my second Halloween movie is also from 1942, a really good year for spooky movies, and it's Cat People. Oh, yes. It was going to be on my list, too. Ah, I, it, it's just it classic, iconic. A lot of people don't realize that Cat People owes a lot to newspaper titan William Randolph Hearst. Really? Well, because when RKO greenlit Orson Welles' masterpiece, Citizen Kane, in 1941, everybody in Hollywood knew that that story was loosely based on Hearst's blind ambition, his rise to the top, and his long-term love affair with actress Marion Davies. Mm -hmm. Well, Hearst was livid about Citizen Kane, and he did everything in his power to stop the movie. He paid film critics to give it a bad review. So he basically caused Citizen Kane to bomb at the box office. Well, this caused great financial hardship to RKO Studios. Mm -hmm. The RKO head, Charles Kerner, he started looking at Universal's monster movies and said, hey, those things make a lot of money. Why don't we open our own horror division? And he put producer Val Luton in charge of it. And Val Luton's an interesting guy. He was a Russian immigrant who'd once worked for David Oselznik as a story editor. He's an uncredited writer on Gone with the Wind. So Val Luton puts together this film, Cat People. He hires DeWitt Bodine to write it. And DeWitt Bodine later went on to write such classics as The Enchanted Cottage, Mm. I Remember Mama, Good, good writer. And it was directed by Jacques Tourner, very iconic film noir director who later went on and did Out of the Past, which is probably one of the prime film noirs ever. And it's a great story. It's just fascinating. It's a psychological thriller. It's about this young engineer named Oliver Reed, played by Kent Smith, who falls in love and marries Irena Dubrovno, a a young Serbian fashion illustrator, played by the French actress Simone uh, Simon. Along the way, there's lots of red flags that maybe something's up with this woman, Irena. Mm -hmm. Um, For one thing, when they first meet, she is obsessively sketching this panther in the zoo. And then she takes him back to her apartment, and there's this creepy sculpture of this Serbian king that's impaled a cat. And he buys her a kitten as a present while they're courting. And the minute the kitten sees her, it hisses and goes crazy. So they, they go to the pet store to return the kitten, and the minute she walks in the pet store, the animals go berserk. Okay, we know something's going on so now. So something ain't right with Arena. That's right. That's right. <laughs> but, you know, it's just a creepy buildup of, of foreboding fear that mm. I think they so masterfully do in this movie. Well, eventually, Irena confesses to him that she is a descendant from the cat people of her village back in Serbia, and that she lives under this ancient curse that she will turn into a deadly panther if she becomes aroused. Oh. And that can mean sexually or jealousy or anger. Anger. Okay. Well, this is kind of groundbreaking for 1942 because nobody was talking about sexual arousal. No, um, no, 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 at, no. At that time. Of course, they soft pedal around it, but you know exactly what she means. So poor Oliver has to be patient. He can't consummate his marriage with his bride. So he tries and tries to be patient. And meanwhile, Irena gets help from a psychiatrist, uh, Dr. Judd played by the always great Tom Conway, Mm. who we're actually going to talk about in a future podcast to great degree. So uh, be on the lookout for that one. Things don't go so well with that psychiatry patient relationship, but you'll have to watch the movie to find out. (laughs) But in the meantime, Oliver's patience is kind of wearing out and he ends up falling in love with a colleague at his engineering firm, Alice Moore, played by Jane Randolph. Well, Irena is having none of this, and believe me, the cat claws come out in I'm all the sure. spookiest, best ways. I won't spoil anything else, but that's basically the I setup for cat people. Part of the brilliance of this movie is the cinematography, and Nicholas Musaraka, he aided the film immensely with his moody shadows, his stealth-like, suspenseful camera work. 
it really created an ambiance that really puts a chill down your spine. Mm-hmm. And more so than ever, it, there's a famous scene that takes place in an apartment building swimming pool in the basement where Alice goes home and decides to take a late night swim and Arena as the cat person comes to pay her a visit. It's chilling. Okay. And there's another scene, and this is where he was so great with his sound editing. Alice is walking home late at night again. Alice, girl, don't walk home alone. <laughs> That's yeah. That's horror movie 101. Exactly, 101. But she's going through the park, and there's just this cadence of her high heels on pavement that is so mm. chilling and haunting. As you know, this cat creature is following, following her, her, and she has no idea. It is just genius. It was made for $134,000. It made $4 million at the box office, which was a huge amount back then. Yes. And it basically put RKO back on financial solid yes, ground. Yes, yes. What a smart move on their part. Very smart. And they tried to remake Cat People. I don't, you, you probably remember in 1982 with Natasha Kinski and Malcolm McDowell. I and do remember Annette that. Annette O'Toole, I think, was the Alice part. It was a disaster. I don't know if you remember it, but it was so bad. It. it was Paul Schrader really did not do the movie okay. justice. I think the basic takeaway from that was don't mess with a classic. Just watch the original Cat People. And again, you can see it now. It's streaming, right? It's streaming. I, I think I just saw it on HBO Max. Check it out. It's really great. We've got three more films to talk about. But before that, let's jump into our Hollywood pop quiz. Steve? Well, in keeping with the Halloween theme, our pop quiz question of the day is the absolute icons of horror movies were Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff. They made eight films together. What was the very first film they made together? Oh my gosh. Okay. I can't wait to hear the answer. Ooh. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Steve and Ann will be right back, but first another stop on the Hollywood tour. Contrary to Hollywood folklore, Cary Grant never uttered the line, Judy, Judy, Judy. Johnny Weissmuller never said, me Tarzan, you Jane, to Maureen O'Sullivan. And Humphrey Bogart didn't demand for Dooley Wilson to play it again, Sam, in Casablanca. He actually said, you played it for her, you can play it for me. And now, back to Stephen and Ann from Beneath the Hollywood Sign. So, my second choice is from 1961. It's a film called The Innocents. <sighs> With Deborah Carr. Okay, I don't know if you know this, but if you go back to my original blog, I list actually 10 movies that I like. The Innocence is one of them. Okay, so I will. We are like right on telepathy. Right, exactly. We've got some spooky telepathy going on. So, this film, it's directed by Jack Clayton, as I said, starring Deborah Carr. It's based on the Henry James novella, The Turn of the Screw, which has been adopted multiple times on stage and on film. The story is essentially a young governess for two children becomes convinced that the house and the grounds are haunted. And the question throughout the whole film is, is it really happening or is she crazy? There have been nine notable adaptations of the novella. Well, oh, I have wow. I know. Isn't that I no amazing? <laughs> I haven't seen all of them, but I'm going to put The Innocence from 1961 as the best. The female performance, the performance of Deborah Carr oh, is amazing. spectacular. The screenplay is an adaptation by William Archibald from his stage adaptation. But in truth, Truman Capote actually did the majority of the script. He was deep into writing In Cold Blood, his seminal nonfiction novel about the two killers and the family they murdered in Kansas. And so early in that process, Capote had retreated to Switzerland to try and finish his book, and he sent pages back to Clayton. So he is really the one that did the majority of the screenplay. Now, it was shot in England at a place called Sheffield Park House and Shepperton Studios, which is very famous. One of the things that is so fascinating about this film and and the next one that I'm going to talk about is the debut of Pamela Franklin, who plays Flora in the film Young Girl. She is quoted as saying that the director, Jack Clayton, never gave the children the whole script. (laughs) So they just shot, he would give the scenes for the next day because he didn't want anything underlying their performance. He wanted it all to be very pure. She said, he just wanted me to be a little girl. That was it. No, no undertones. Now, a lot of people will know Pamela Franklin, if you look her up, as probably, I think of her as the prime of Miss Jean Brody. Yes. Eight years later. Yes. But what else? she is on television all over the place in and, the 60s and the 70s. And what is what is your... Well, can I just say, yes. and, and this is what I love her in, and it also is in my blog about spooky movies. Oh. She was the lead, along with Kate 
Kate Jackson in Satan School for Girls. Yes. She plays a wonderful bad girl. Like, yes. not bad girl, scary girl. And she really, in the 60s and 70s, oh, she was all over uh, television. She is quoted as saying that perhaps doing as much television as she did back then was a mistake. It limited her career. Nowadays, we would not say that. Nowadays, no. television is, is all about film. Meryl Streep's doing TV. Exactly. <laughs> but I, she's one of my favorite yes. actresses from that time period. Me too. I love her. Martin Stevens plays Miles. Um, he also talked about the director being fantastically patient with them. His mother had told him the story, so he knew what was happening in the story <laughs> ahead of time. But he later got together with Deborah Carr when he was an adult, and he said that Deborah Carr said to him that she considers that role probably one of the most challenging parts she's ever played. Oh, wow. And the way that she threads the needle of, is she crazy or is this happening yeah. to her? It's a very difficult thing to do. Yeah. It'll also come up in this next film that I'll talk about. But one of the things I learned about it is the sharp black and white visuals in that film are stunning. You talked about that yes. with cat people. So the director of photography, whose name is Freddie Francis, he used huge bright lights to create that contrast. And Deborah Carr apparently sometimes had to resort to wearing sunglasses <laughs> between takes because it was so bright. Wow. When you look even at the photos online, the sharp contrast of black and white is beautiful. He also, Freddie Francis, had custom candles made with four or five wicks entwined to produce more light. Oh, um, wow. So, Very clever. Yeah, I thought that was another interesting point. Producer and director Jack Clayton turned down the offer of Cary Grant to play the uncle. I don't know why. Wow, I didn't know that. But Michael Redgrave, yes. who's no slouch. Who's pretty good himself. Yeah, he he ends up playing the role. And oh, wow. the only thing I can think of is that perhaps Cary Grant by 1961 had really all, already established himself in people's minds as Cary Grant. Yeah. And that he really wanted the uncle to be a more mysterious figure. It's another film. It gets under your skin. Oh. You can't stop watching it once you start. It's true. And there's a couple of gasps, maybe more than a couple. For the first time seeing it, it's a true pleasure to get to watch this. The Innocence, 1961. Don't miss it. A great choice. Gotta love that movie. You're so right. All right. Your turn. All right. Well, my final movie that I wanted to talk about for the Halloween season. Yes. It's a very little known film that sort of become a cult classic in the last 20 years and it's called Carnival of Souls. Oh, I do not know this film. Oh, then you're in for a treat. It's such a psychological thriller. It's directed by a man named Herc Harvey and if that name is not familiar, there's probably a reason. It's the one and only feature film he ever did. Oh. He was a local guy in Lawrence, Kansas, who worked making industrial films. And he got the idea to direct this movie when he was driving cross country. And he saw a thing called the Salt Air Pavilion, which was an abandoned castle-like building on the south side of the Great Salt Lake in Utah. When he saw this location, he had this whole idea of, of this movie that surrounded this eerie location. So he hired a buddy of his to write the script. It was filmed for $33,000 oh on location in Lawrence, Kansas and Salt Lake City. And you'll notice when you see the movie that he's inspired by Ingmar Bergman and Jean Cocteau. It's very stark. It's very interesting. It's very minimalistic in the way he shoots it. And he cast a very unknown, very inexperienced 20-year-old New York theater actress named Candace Hillegoss to play the lead. Hmm. And she was a young actress from the Midwest who'd gone to New York. She studied with Lee Strasberg. It was her film debut. And, and you could tell and she's kind of wooden. Uh -huh. She's kind of she reminds me a little bit of that cool aloofness that Tippi Hedren had. Sure. That you weren't sure if it was a character trait or she just wasn't a very skilled actress. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Tippi. But it kind of works for this character, and, and we'll kind of get into what her character is. Interesting thing about Candace Hillegoss, she's still around. She lives in Beverly Hills, and she actually has a website. So oh. if you want to go and buy an 8 by 10 of her from this movie, okay. <laughs> she will sell it to you. So the movie, it's about this young woman named Mary Henry from Lawrence, Kansas, and she is the sole survivor of a car crash with two girlfriends that plunges 
over a bridge into this muddy river. She survives it, and she's completely traumatized, so she decides to get out of town, and she scores a job as a church organist, because she is a musician. Mm -hmm. And she moves to Salt Lake City to start a new life, you know, try to forget the past and what she's gone through. Well, during the course of her moving, she starts being haunted by this eerie apparition of this ghoulish man with blackened eyes in a dark suit. And he pops up in mirrors and, and you know, reflections of car windows. And oh. um, it's just this haunting, creepy. haunting, creepy man. And she doesn't know what it is. And she gets to Salt Lake City. She gets a rooming house. She starts the job at the church as an organist. And then she's also strangely drawn to this abandoned carnival pavilion, which sits on part of the Great Salt Lake that's dried up. So it looks like this desert of this weird castle-like building on this dried up muddy desert. It's so, it just the image alone is so chilling. And she doesn't know why she's drawn there, but uh, she just keeps being pulled to this place. And some of the photography of her going through this abandoned carnival is some of the best photography I've, I've seen in a, this kind of genre of a movie. Mm -hmm. It's definitely just the psychological thriller that keeps the audience guessing what's real, what's not real, what's in her imagination, uh, what might be part of a whole different dimension. Not to give too much away, but it has a twist in the end that will make your jaw drop. Okay. And it really brings everything home. It's unbelievable that it was made so well on such a low budget when it first came out in 1962, it made no money. It was just kind of this forgotten movie. But in the 1980s, it was sort of rediscovered when we all had VHS. VHSs. Yes. And it got this incredible cult following. And now it's sort of seen as this premier psychological thriller movie in the genre. And it's influenced filmmakers like David Lynch and George A. Romero and David Wan, all from this little tiny movie that shot in Kansas by this local guy. And it really is guerrilla filmmaking at its best. I am adding it to the list. Well, one of the best features about this movie is they use this high-pitched organ music as the soundtrack, and it will chill you to the bone. Well, when you said she was an organist, I thought, ooh, that's gonna, <laughs> that's going to play into this oh, this film. Because she's lost her religion. There, there's lots of religious themes involved in her trying to find herself, mm -hmm. and it's all about the fighting of, of your soul. It's really a complicated, beautifully produced movie, and everybody should take a look at it. All right. Also, you can find it on HBO Max and other streaming services. Perfect for the season. Yes. All right, last film. Ooh. Okay, this was tricky. It was hard to choose, but I just, I watched it again two days ago, and I just, ha we had to go with it. Let's scare Jessica to death. Oh, stop it. 1971. Get out of my head. <laughs> I love that movie. I love Who it Who even knows that movie? You know, I remember it as a kid, but I hadn't seen it in a long time, and I'm not even sure that I ever watched it as a kid all the <sighs> way through because I thought it was so scary. So scary. But here's the tagline that I love. Something is after Jessica. Something very cold, very wet, and very dead. <laughs> it's so great. It's the feature directorial debut of John D. Hancock, although he had been nominated for an Academy Award for his first short film. Oh. So he, you know, had some pedigree. It was co-written by him and Lee Kalsheim. I believe that's how you pronounce it. Now, he's a director known for a few movies from the 70s, and he's worked into the 80s with Sam Elliott in 89. He directed Prancer. Oh. Um, <laughs> Baby Blue Marine with Jan Michael Vincent in Ooh. 1976, probably best known for directing in 1973, Bang the Drum Slowly with Robert De Niro. Oh, I love that And movie. Vincent Gardenia, yes. who was nominated for an Academy Award. Such a Award. great movie. Now, Hancock, director Hancock, started as a stage director. And in fact, he had worked with a lot of actresses that were stage actresses that he ended up casting in this film. So the basic plot is this. It's going to sound kind of familiar <laughs> to, to some of these other stories. A woman is released from a mental hospital, and she moves to an old countryside house with her husband and a friend to recuperate, but she begins having strange visions and experiences around the property. Is there really something strange happening? Or ah, is it all in her mind? All in her mind. So this film features, as I said, I don't want to use the word, overuse the word, but there are three terrific actresses in yes, this film. there are. Lots of them went on to be staples in the 70s and 80s. 
Mary Claire Costello, who folks might know from many things, but I recall her from The Waltons. She played yes. Miss Hunter, the teacher yes. that inspires John Boy. She ends up marrying John Ritter. Gretchen Corbett, who... Who did everything in the 70s and 80s. Everything in the 70s yes. and 80s. And in the 90s, I got to see her on stage oh. with John Glover in a play uh, at the Taper. She was phenomenal. Oh, wow. But the lead role of Jessica, I have a new favorite actress having rewatched this. Zora Lambert is... It's a performance not to be missed. Can I just say, I think she is one of the most underrated performers yes. of her generation. She is so underrated. You cannot yes. take your eyes off her. Everything she does. And I think, why was she never a big movie star? Did you see her in Splendor in the Grass? Yes. Oh. Opposite Warren Beatty. Yes. They end up getting married in the film. She's She's phenomenal. She's exquisite. And she began in the theater. She's a two-time Tony nominee, Mother Courage and Her Children with Anne Bancroft, directed by Jerome Robbins. The other play she was nominated for, directed by Jose Quintero. This woman, she studied with Uta Hagen and Mira Rostova, who was Montgomery Cliff's acting coach. She won a primetime Emmy in 1985 for uh, an episode of Kojak. Oh, I didn't know that. She really is this film to me. If I'm not mistaken, I think she's from Middle Eastern descent, but they always had her playing Italian and Spanish. And she was just that, she was ubiquitous enough in her ethnicity that she fit into a lot of yes. areas. And I think the lens back in the 70s would have probably... We just weren't as open as we hopefully yes. are now. But she is oh. she is this film. It's interesting, Mary Claire Costello, the role that she ends up playing, she was actually a last minute, uh, had to quickly fly to Connecticut where they were filming. They fired whoever was cast before her. So she kind of went into it not knowing much, but she and Zora had been in acting class together, so they oh, knew each other. I love that. There's a couple of funny stories that she tells in, in various forms. There's a scene in the movie where they have a, a mole. It becomes a pet mole for Jessica, and it's kept in kind of this cookie jar. And it really wasn't a mole. They couldn't find a mole, so they had a mouse. You know, this is a low-budget film. But essentially, Mary Claire is told by the crew member you have to go kill the mouse. This is the scene we're filming now. And she's like, no, I'm not really going to kill the mouse. And he's like, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you have to kill the mouse. That's what we're going to film. She said, I'm not killing a mouse. <laughs> Good for her. She ran, she hid, and they ended up getting somebody on crew to put the costume on. You never see her face in the scene. And she will not verify or deny whether, <laughs> whether the mouse was actually killed. But she had no part in it. So, well, where is the ASPCA when you need them? I am telling you, indie filmmaking, right? It was shot over 26 days in October and November. And what's interesting about that, in Connecticut, right? So October, November, Connecticut, 1970, multiple scenes in the water. <laughs> and when you look at it with the perspective of knowing how cold it was, you can see that they're all kind of shivering. <laughs> it got to the point where they would have to be taken out of the water and warmed up in the trailer. They even had whiskey or something to keep them, because they were worried about hypothermia. Wow. A few of the crew who had to get in the water, they were scared about that as well. But Hancock, you know, he adapted this very, very loosely from a film that was supposed to be a satire, and he ended up bringing a lot of his own history as a child into it. You know, he had a fruit farm where he was born, so that, the fruit farm, plays a huge part in it. There's a pretty awful scene that happens. That's Won't right. give is that it, away. Is it set in Connecticut? Or did he just choose Connecticut it's set, as a it's filming set, location? I believe it's set in Connecticut, or at least in the upper Northeast. And his father, Hancock's father, also played stand-up bass. And the container, the, the case for the stand-up bass plays a big part. And it's also just, it's a creepy-ass case. So it's just, creepy. It's so like so creepy. creepy. I don't want to give anything really more away other than to say you cannot take your eyes off of Zora Lampert. And wherever she is, she's still alive. Yep. You have a huge fan. Lu Two Luminous. huge fans. Luminous. Yeah. I, I'm such a fan of hers. I, yeah. Oh, what a great choice for Halloween. Yeah, it's a scary movie. To me, the ending is a bit lacking. There's something you have to kind of buy into. But even barring that, there are lots of scares. And it's another one that really gets under your skin. I love it. I think it's time for the answer to our Hollywood pop quiz. Yes, it is. And the question was, we all know that Bela Lugosi and Boris Karloff were the kings of horror. What was the first film they appeared in together? And the answer is from 1934, The Black Cat. 
Oh. So we have a cat theme today. We do have a cat theme. All right. And I hope you've enjoyed our little ride down the road here of some lesser known chili movies that you can enjoy for Halloween. So pull up the covers, keep the lights on. Get that popcorn going. Ignore that thump in the night and, and watch some of these great movies. And thanks again for listening. And we'd love to hear from you. So if you have any comments or questions or, or anything, be sure and email us at info at from beneath the Hollywood sign.com. That's this week's view. From Beneath the Hollywood Sign. You've been listening to From Beneath the Hollywood Sign with Steve Kubine and Nan McNamara, the podcast that celebrates amazing stories of Tinseltown from its golden era. Join us next week for another episode and learn something else about Hollywood you probably never knew. Take a moment and give us a five-star rating and a positive review. And tell your friends about us, too. It'll help grow the podcast. Visit Steve's website at FromBeneathTheHollywoodSign.com. The executive producers are Steve Kubine and Nan McNamara, executive producer and post-production supervisor Lindsay Schnebley. This podcast is part of the Airwave Media Podcast Network. Visit airwavemedia.com to listen and subscribe to their other fine shows like The Box of Oddities and The Shallow End with Schnebley and Toth. Copyright 2023. All rights reserved. That's a wrap.